that button. Uh, okay, that's okay. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to give you a talk about the diagrammatic aspect of the Nielsen identity. And thank you all for giving me this chance to make this presentation. And uh, before uh, starting the main body of this presentation, and I'm going to make a brief description about the Nielsen identity. And as everybody knows, um, under the frame set of the gauge field theory, uh, for the, all the physical observables uh, should be gauge independent. However, uh, all the other unphysical parameters intermediating the calculations might be gauge dependent. Uh, in the literature, usually they say that the physical, the gauge independence of the physical observables uh, are guaranteed by the so-called the Nielsen identity. And here uh, is the complete form of the Nielsen identity. And uh, in this identity, the gamma indicates the gamma functional and which is the uh, functional uh, dependent. <laughs> Sorry. Here, uh, here is the complete form of the Nielsen identity. And the gamma here indicates the gamma functional, which, are, which is the uh, function of the field value phi, or all the field values of phi, c, or psi, and et cetera. And uh, this uh, gamma functional is equivalent to the effective potential. Uh, and uh, on the left-hand side of this, uh, equation, the delta gamma phi indicates that if we change the get fixing term just a little bit, then uh, the effective potential or the gamma functional may change accordingly a little bit. And on the right hand side of this uh, equation, and we can see this is proportional to delta gamma over delta phi i. And in at the stationary point where the delta gamma over delta phi i equals zero, uh, which means if the gamma obeys the solution to the equation of motion, then uh, obviously the delta gamma phi uh, will become zero on the left-hand side of this uh, equation. And uh, therefore, uh, because many of the physical observables depend on this gamma function, for example, uh, the bubble nucleation rate uh, when the system experiences a first order phase transition or the gravitational wave generation during the first order phase transition. And all these observables depend upon this gamma or the latent energy between two phases. Therefore, uh, this uh, Nielsen identity guarantees uh, the independence of the, guarantees the independence of all the physical observables uh, near the stationary point if the gamma obeys uh, the equation of motion. Hello. One one question. Okay. So in the first line, you have a uh, delta gamma over delta phi i. Yes. Then the, what what is the x dependent x y dependence of uh, numerator and denominator? Uh, uh, yeah. The the gamma is the function of phi. Okay. So mm. it does not include any x or y, mm. but for the phi, yeah, uh, it uh, for for this phi, yeah, uh, it depends on x. Okay. Yeah. And in the in the bracket, the delta prime f y, and uh, f is any uh, any operator. Or uh, yeah, f have? is some other operators. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And. Uh, um, in a specific case of the arc psi gauge or the arc psi bar gauge. And uh, on the left-hand side of this equation, it will become the partial gamma over uh, partial psi. And this psi is the parameter of the, is the psi parameter of the arc psi gauge. And uh, it will appear in the gauge fixing term. And on the right-hand side of this equation, the C phi x, uh, the definition of the C phi x or the CRX uh, is 
showed below. And it is a mixture of all these operators and uh, uh, all and the summation of all the one particle irreducible diagrams. Yeah. However, uh, in the literature, when people prove the Nielsen identity, uh, all the above discussions uh, depends upon the non-perturbative path, path integral analysis. However, uh, it is very difficult for us to sum over all of the diagram, possible diagrams when we are calculating a, a effective potential. So uh, practical calculations in the literature all involves the perturbative analysis or at least the, the resumation analysis. Uh, but this resumation analysis is not the full resumation, it is only partial resumation. So if we just resum a fraction of all the diagrams uh, among all the diagrams and uh, take the results into this, substitute this result into this Nielsen identity, we will always find that the Nielsen identity will never be rigorously satisfied. So this is the problem. Uh, as an example, a very important example, if we take the result of the coleman wimberg potential into this, um, into this Nielsen identity, and you can see on the left-hand side of this equation, and all the gamma includes all the one loop diagrams because the coleman wimber potential is only a resumation of all the possible one loop and the tree level uh, diagrams. So at the left-hand side of this equation, uh, we will include all the contributions from the one loop diagrams. But however, on the right-hand side of this equation, we can see as the definition of the C5 is at least the one loop diagram contributed here. For example, the C5, you can see that uh, it is an operator. It is a, uh, it is a multiplication of two operators and uh, depending on both X and Y. And at least the two propagators will propagate from the, uh, the space-time point X to the space-time point Y. So therefore the CR or C5 should be at least uh, one loop. And uh, therefore the delta gamma over delta phi should be only including the tree level contributions in order to balance the loop numbers on both sides of this equation. And uh, I can show you a more intuitive uh, picture about that. For example, here on the left-hand side of this equation, if we just uh, take into account all the coleman wenberg potential terms, and we will have a lot of one loop diagrams, and on the right-handed side of this uh, equation, the lowest uh, uh, non-trivial contribution to the C5 should be the one loop level. And uh, this X here uh, appearing in um, both the delta gamma over delta phi X and the C phi X will connect the diagrams in the delta gamma over delta phi term with the C phi term. Therefore, uh, these two diagrams will connect with each other. Uh, so the only diagrams appearing in the delta gamma over delta phi x should be uh, tree level. Therefore, we can see that on both sides of this equation, the levels, the loop levels appearing on both the gammas are different in orders. Oh, oh one more question here. Okay. Yeah, here the, in the uh, last equation, you have a uh... Or uh, del mu a mu plus g psi v plus phi phi. Eh? Yeah, yeah. So, well, well, what's the argument of these uh, functions? Is it x or y? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, this depends on y. Okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because if I just write too many y's, uh, the formula will be very, very long. <laughs> okay. So. If we take into account the one loop contribution on the right-hand side of this equation inside the delta gamma over delta phi, then we can see that on the left-hand side of this equation, the partial gamma over partial psi will be forced to include the two loop diagrams. And so here, uh, if we want that the delta gamma over delta phi to be at least one loop level, and since the C5 should be at least one loop level, then on the left-hand side of this equation, it is very difficult to reach a loop balance uh, among this equation. So in the literature, uh, people usually depend uh, upon the so-called H-bar expansion. 
uh, usually that's roughly speaking, the H bar orders is equivalent to the expansion on the loops orders. Uh, so on the left-hand side of this equation, the gamma can be expanded into gamma zero plus, uh, gamma zero means the tree level contribution, the H bar gamma one means the coleman weinberg one loop contributions and the uh, gamma uh, H bar square times gamma two, which means that all the two loop contributions and et cetera. However, uh, on the right hand side of this equation, uh, the C phi can only be expanded upon uh, into H bar C1 plus H bar square C2, which means that the lowest order of the C should be uh, the first order uh, should be H bar H bar one. So therefore, there is always a H bar unbalance at the left hand side and the right hand side of this equation. So in the literature to solve this H bar unbalance, um, one has to expand everything up to a particular H bar order to truncate the series. Uh, this everything means uh, the physical observables and all the unphysical observables. So in the literature, uh, all the so-called get invariant evaluations, as I know, uh, all depends on the H bar expansion trick. Uh, for example, uh, the Anders Anderson, uh, they wrote a paper, a uh, very famous paper, uh, which is called the consistent use of the standard model effective potential. And they performed the, the DAISY resumption. And they claimed that their results are get independent. However, uh, they just uh, expand the effective potential up to orders, uh, up to series uh, of H bar and truncated the series up to the H bar square order. Uh, this method is very, uh, is very, this method is very convenient for the analytical evaluation. Uh, however, if we want to perform a numerical evaluation, uh, for example, if we add some new physics Higgs bosons into our, into our, into our theory, then we have to deal with multiple, uh, we have to deal with the faces uh, within multiple orders of parameters. And we could only uh, use the numerical to calculate the effective potential and uh, et cetera. And therefore, uh, because all the calculations are numerical, it is very difficult for us uh, to separate all the different H bar order terms. Sorry. <laughs> um, so if I speak English, the series will, <laughs> will take action. <laughs> okay. Uh, here, my final destination, uh, my target, is to reach an H bar ba balance method to calculate the effective potential and uh, let the effective potential to satisfy the Nielsen identity. Uh, but uh, this is very hard for me to accomplish. Uh, so this destination had not been accomplished yet. However, uh, during this process, I studied the structure of the Nielsen, uh, the diagram diagrammatic structure of the Nielsen identity. And I think uh, this study can help people to calculate the effective potential up to all orders um, and uh, to examine their, their results. So um, it's still helpful, helpful for current practical calculations. So uh, I just uh, wrote a paper and uh, posted this to the archive about the proof of the Nielsen identity in a diagrammatic form. And the complete proof of this uh, Nielsen identity diagrammatically is too technical to be presented in this talk. So uh, in this talk, I just uh, make a very sketchy description here. And uh, in the literature, the previous discussions of the Nielsen identity were mainly based upon the path integral methods. The proof of the Nielsen identity was based upon the path integral methods before. Uh, for the practical perturbative discussions, uh, usually people just uh, calculate the loop contributions to the effective potential and integrate up to all the loop momentums before verifying and before taking the results into the Nielsen identity to verify this identity. However, uh, in Peskin's book, uh, there, is a, there is a diagrammatic proof of the Watakahashi identity there. 
uh, although they proved there in the this what Takahashi identity in the unbroken phase. And uh, within their proof of the what Takahashi identity, they just uh, work inside the integration mark and uh, to work with the integrands. And the integrands inside the integration uh, signs uh, keeps the structure of the Feynman diagram. So it is very uh, convenient for me. So it is very convenient for me uh, to use, uh, to copy, to follow the Peskin's uh, method to prove the Nielsen identity diagrammatically. So here is the basic idea to prove the what Takahashi identity in the broken phase. And uh, uh, before I, uh, in, collaborating, uh, in collaboration with Professor Cole, we published the paper about the uh, dark matter bound states. And uh, we also discussed the gauge invariance of the dark of the physical observables of the dark matter bound states there. And in this appendix, uh, we just uh, uh, we just proved the what Takahashi identity diagrammatically there in the broken phase. Um, the basic idea is that if we change uh, one of the external lines of the vector boson and, and change the polarization vector into its momentum and let the momentum to be dotted into this diagram. And uh, we can see finally that if the vector boson is exactly on shell, then this vector boson can be replaced with a goldstone boson dotted into it. So this is a so this is the foundation of the famous uh, goldstone equivalence theorem. Uh, usually in the literature or in the textbook, goldstone equivalence theorem is described to be a, an approximation. But here, the goldstone equivalence is actually dependent upon a rigorously satisfied equation or identity which is just the called the what Takahashi identity in the broken phase. Um, in that paper, we just uh, talked about the, the, the case when the, um, when the external line of the vector bo boson is on shell. However, if the external line of the vector boson, boson becomes off shell, then in this case, uh, not only the Goldstone boson terms, uh, equivalent terms will arise, but also the ghost term will also arise. And uh, to prove the what Takahashi identity diagrammatically in the broken phase, uh, we just developed the method uh, described in the Peskin's book. And uh, here is a very basic ex example. Uh, for example, if this K propagator is dotted into a fermionic line here, the chi alpha chi B and chi A, chi B, and chi B. And here we can see that we can use the trick that the K mu is equivalent uh, to the P plus K mu minus P mu. And it is also equivalent to the P plus K plus K prime mu minus K plus K prime mu. And both these two terms will cancel one of the propagate, one of the ambient propagators, uh, one of the poles of the ambient propagators, and we are results in two terms. And if the if we enumerate all the possible positions for this vector boson to insert into this diagram, we will see that all the terms that the poles to be canceled by the p plus k or the p mu will cancel each other. And the result is that the remaining terms are just the goldstone equivalence terms or the ghost terms. So here uh, we can just uh, cast this trick to the Nielsen identity. And look at the left-handed side of this equation. We'll see that the partial derivatives on psi. And for the all the propagators of the for all the propagators mm, of the particles we see that only three terms are dependent upon the psi. These are the, the A mu propagator or the vector boson propagator, the ghost propagator, and the goldstone propagator. And taking the partial derivative over psi, 
will result in three results of these propagators. And look at the first line of the vector boson's uh, propagator. And we'll see that if we take the side deriv derivations, and we'll see clearly that the p mu and p nu will arise. So here, it means that this p mu and p nu can be regarded just uh, very similar to the go uh, to the word Takahashi identity case, and will be dotted into the uh, remain part of the diagrams, and will render the propagator of the vector boson to be a Goldstone boson or the ghost boson uh, or the ghost particle. And after the first process of this uh, process, that we can change part of this uh, vector boson into a ghost boson, uh, into a goldstone boson or a ghost particle, we'll see that there will appear an additional K2 mu uh, in the next step of this vector boson. Then here, uh, then the similar process can appear and reappear and reappear uh, recursively. And uh, I just enumerated all the diagrammatical patterns that I can consider that the vector Goldstone boson chain can encounter. And finally, uh, this recursive process will render all the vector Goldstone chain to become a ghost chain plus a chain started with a ghost Goldstone chain. And uh, to inverse this process back, similarly, a ghost chain and a chain started with a goldstone boson can also be restored to a vector goldstone chain. So here is the basic idea of the proof. And here in the first line of this uh, PPT, uh, we can see that the vector boson after derivative the over by psi, and it can become a gold, it can become a ghost chain and plus something that started with a goldstone chain and ended with a vector boson's chain. Uh, similarly, a, goldstone, a ghost chain can also be rendered into a chain started with a goldstone chain and ended with a vector boson chain, and plus a chain completely started and ended with a goldstone. And the, all these terms on the right hand, uh, inside the, the, the red ellipses can all cancel are all canceled each uh, are all canceled each other and will vanish finally and uh, with only the terms inside the azure uh, the azure ovals remains and what are these the terms within the right hand side of the 36 and i will explain it later and during the during the calculation we need to emphasize that there are quite different things between the word Takahashi identity and the Nielsen identity. Uh, in the literature, when we talk about the word Takahashi identity, we are dealing with the connected diagrams. However, in the Nielsen identity, we, works, we work with the one particle irreducible connected diagrams. Therefore, some diagrams which are expected to cancel the other terms in the proof of the word Takahashi identity does not appear inside the one particle irreducible connected diagrams because they are no longer one particle irreducible. So in order to illustrate this, I introduced the concept so-called a Gould structure. And so a Gould structure is something like this one. Uh, a diagram can, if a diagram can be departed into two parts with, only, with the only connection of one common vertex or one common side, then uh, this diagram is called a gourd diagram. And the waist of this diagram can separate the gourd into two parts. And one of them, I call it the bark part. The other, the other part, I call it the C part. And if we take the psi partial derivative on the C part, we can just uh, prolong, uh, we can just uh, replace this uh, vector and uh, ghost stone ch chains, and uh, we render them into ghost uh, ghost chains and the ghost stone vector chains. However, 
if this process just uh, encounter the waste of the gourd, and we can see here as an example, uh, the diagram inside the red circle cannot be cannot be uh, might not be canceled by some other diagrams. For example, here, if we just uh, uh, prolong our process to render all the vector boson and ghost stone boson into the ghost chains, and the process just uh, encounter the waste of the gourd, then on the right hand side of this. Uh, on the right hand side of this, this it is not an equation in, in this picture. And uh, in the case of the Wat Takahashi identity, it should be canceled with another gourd, just to connect it with one S channel internal line. But such kind of diagram does not exist in the Nielsen identity because this is no longer one particle irreducible. So here, this term should only remain uh, and uh, becomes become the terms within the right-handed side of the 36 mentioned in this picture. So finally, we just uh, see that these remain terms are actually within the form of the right-handed side of the Nielsen identity. And all the other exotic terms inside this red circles are canceled each other. And only terms like the right-handed side of this picture just remained, and they are compatible with the right-handed side of the uh, Nielsen identity. Therefore, we finished the proof of the Nielsen identity diagrammatically. So here, although we have finished the proof of the Nielsen identity um, in a diagrammatic form, and uh, I would like to uh, make some prospect of the application of this proof. Uh, for example, uh, if we just uh, if we want to uh, if we want to acquire a, a effective potential that fits the Nielsen identity up to all orders, and we can have a try. For the first time, uh, firstly, uh, we just uh, keep the C phi the one loop contribution to the C phi, and take the one loop contributions of the gamma on the right hand side of this equation, and then we will have uh, on the left-hand side of this equation, we will have to we will have to include the two-loop diagrams. However, on the right-hand side of this uh, equation, if we take into consider all of the two-loop diagrams in the delta gamma over delta phi term, then we are forced to include the three-loop results on the left-hand side of this equation, and etc. If we just uh, uh, stack all of the loops together, and we will reach the so-called the super daisy di diagrams here. Uh, usually, in the literature, when people perform the daisy resumption, uh, they only perform one layer of daisy diagram, which means a main part of the diagram uh, plus just the one layer of the ringlet. And occasionally, in the literature, when people talk about the super daisy diagrams. It means that the ringlets can uh, attach another ringlet. A ringlet can attach another ringlet, and therefore to form a cactus diagram. Uh, however, if we want to reach uh, effect an effective potential which satisfies the Nielsen identity up to all H bar orders, it means that we have to resume an infinite layer of super daisy diagrams. However, uh, this is very difficult for me to, uh, to accomplish, and uh, I'm still working in this subject. So uh, that's all. Here is all I have done recently. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Any question or comments? Um, let me, I'll ask a question. So I'm familiar a little bit with electroweak baryogenesis. And from my understanding in electric baryogenesis, one problem people have is that the mm -hmm. 
Asymmetry degenerate is gauge dependent due to the effective potential being gauge dependent. Yes. Is th is this uh, somehow going to be solvable using your your methods in the in the future? You think or not? Because I uh, I, I think yeah. I think, so. I think it should it, it should be resolved, uh, but I'm not quite sure about that. I only finished right. the, the proof of the uh, Nielsen identity and look into the structures of the Nielsen identity, but I'm not sure whether uh, this this very this hard task to resume all of the super daisy diagrams uh, can be accomplished. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I see. But uh, if it can be accomplished, I, I think uh, it can be resolved. So just to be clear, is the, are you then saying that the the gauge the, the inherent gauge dependence of the effective potential will be resolved or somehow in the calcul I, I'm not even sure if you, you're you know well versed in electric barogenesis or you think that in the calculation somehow the gauge dependence will cancel the gauge dependence of the effective potential. Yes. Yeah, I think so. I okay. Think okay. And uh, maybe I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, that would be pretty amazing, actually. But yeah, uh, but uh, to perform a complete resummation of the super daisy diagrams, it is. Uh, I think it is very technical. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it's. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I think the uh, to most audience, the the Nielsen identity itself is, is a, a very new. I think. So could you mention briefly uh, the what it means really? I mean, what's the physical meaning of the Nielsen identity? Uh, I think I just mentioned it. Uh, yeah, like uh, I mean, you mentioned uh, what I what Takashi identity is. Uh, for co connected diagram and uh, uh, this identity is for one PI diagram. Yes. Uh, the Nielsen identity um, had a long history. And I think when the Nielsen published the first paper about the Nielsen identity, it was in the 1970s or 1980s. Uh, yeah. And uh, it means that the gauge, um, the, the effective potential of a get field theory, it is non-physical yet because it is not an observable. So as the gauge changes, as, as, as we changes the gauge, um, the effective potential will change accordingly because these are not, these are non-observables. But the energy of this effective potential in the stationary point, uh, which means that for example, it, in, the, in the vacuum, around the vacuum, around the minima of this effective potential should not be changed. And uh, that was described by Peskin uh, in his book, uh, but he did not mention the detail of it. And he quoted the Nielsen's um, paper about it. So uh, the Nielsen identity show us how the effective poten uh, potential changes as we change the, uh, as we change the uh, gauge fixing terms. However, we will see that with, within some particular points in this effective potential, their values does not change because these values in the vacuum are the vacuum energies. And as I understand, the energies are uh, some kind of uh, physical observables. And the energy of, a, of the vacuum are some kind of physical observables. So they will never change as we change the psi or the gauge fixing terms. No, I think the you I I don't know the uh, detail. I mean, I don't know the detail the history. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if th this your diagrammatic uh, proof is a uh, uh, new or you or there there may be some old literature about that. We did which we don't know. But the, anyway, I think it's very interesting ah. approach. I think and. Uh, I think the basically what you what you say is that the I mean if if the the user identity says that the 
uh, for the uh, three level or for the uh, configuration that satisfies the uh, uh, equations of motion, there is no gauge dependence, right? I think this, in a sense, reminds me that the, you know there are uh, recently there have been a lot of progress in the amplitude method, which mm -hmm. does not rely on the uh, action or Lagrangian, but it just use the kinematic variables of the onshore particles. And from the beginning, there is no gauge dependence. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I think they basically, uh, so I, I don't think there is a well-developed, uh, uh, I mean, I don't think there is a, uh, something, uh, something that there is a counterpart of the Wilson, uh, sorry, Nielsen identity in that amplitude method. But I think the, what you are saying here is basically, also uh, is uh, pretty well now established in the amplitude method. Uh, yes, of course, it's a, of course it's a for general temperature case, of course, yeah. But uh, anyway, I think this is a, uh, but, uh, but here the Wilson, Wilson identity itself also applies to general temperature case, right? Uh, yes, of course. It's, uh, a, it's a independent of temperature, right? Yeah, the proof is yeah. dependent of the temperature. Okay, okay. And it, it works upon to uh, all the temperatures. Uh, no matter the 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 path integral proof or my diagrammatic, mm -hmm, proof, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm, it is okay. independent upon the temperature. Mm -hmm. Because I am working inside the integration uh, mm -hmm. uh, lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the difference between the zero temperature and the uh, finite temperature is only rely, uh, lies on the lies on the 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 time integration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I work inside the integration, and mm -hmm. work inside in the integrands, and all the propagators are just uh, the same. Yeah, but for the daisy diagram, if I remember correctly, then it's uh, just the resummation of. Uh, particular type of uh, diagram, which, for example, which can be important in high temperature case. Uh, right? so, uh, yeah, but for so, my... But for so it's, a, it's a just, a, it's not really a loop, uh, how to say, loop, loop expansion, because it, it resumes one, two, three loop in a particular class of diagrams. Mm. Uh, I mean, daisy, super daisy, daisy, etc. Yeah. Uh, my proof uh, is not is independent upon the diagrams, and it mm. is effective to all of the diagrams that you can give. Um, but um, my future prospect uh, just mm -hmm. uh, just depend on some. Particular specific diagrams, mm -hmm. such as daisy diagrams. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your interesting talk. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? No, well, I see no more question. Then let's thanks to the speaker. Thanks for the nice talk. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Have a nice day.